Hey brother Hear me now Brother dog Know me Understand Welcome to the Sargasset Podcast. I'm Robbie Thigpen. I'm Francesca Elmer. And I am Mar Fernandez. And we are your hosts for today. And we are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about sargassum and sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing today? Good morning. Hello. We're doing fine. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. So this is uh Fred and Mar, has uh anything interesting happened to you guys this week? Something you want to brag about? Something you need to fun, something funny you want to tell us? Something embarrassing? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean in northern Germany the weather has been pretty crazy, so I didn't do anything funny outdoors, but indoors I discovered really cool new videos about uh, ocean negative emission technologies, and I got very excited when they mentioned sargassum branching. So that was my star of the of the week and that's about it too much time in front of the computer i guess yeah nice nice how about you francis yeah i mean in playa del carmen mm -hmm. the weather is nice so spend a lot of time outside yeah i saw that video mar posted which is really really cool and i got really excited when sargassum was was mentioned as a single algae like there wasn't any other algae mentioned otherwise and today i actually also saw a post about people who want to put kelp out in the open ocean and with buoys that are biodegradable and then once the kelp grows enough it will weigh down the buoys and literally all the kelp will go down onto the sea, grass, sea floor and then capture carbon so that was really exciting as well next to the video Mark posted as well. Yeah, what about you Robbie? It's made of uh, bamboos right? I guess so I didn't say I'm actually super excited about the interview you have today. But yeah, Robbie, what did you do this week? Tell I us. didn't do anything. I, I came home from uh, New Orleans and um, had a safe trip and was happy about that. I did get to hide some Easter eggs on Sunday for my uh, nephews in, uh, up in North Carolina. And as a matter of fact, this, in the last month, I got to meet one of them for the first time because I hadn't met him since COVID. And so me and him got to hang out. And we, we found the eggs together. And then I, had a, I had just a really, really good time doing that. And I was spending some time with them and everybody, everybody in the family and the extended family have been vaccinated. So I, I got to be a part of a new pod and, um, and that was very exciting. It's just, yeah, it's really, I'm really glad that people are getting vaccinated and that's making me very happy because together we can defeat this thing. Yeah, it's cool in the US it's going so fast. In Europe, we're a little bit behind. So yeah, Easter was kind of you were not allowed to visit family or anything, but yeah, my kid was also very excited to find all the eggs in the garden. That's a very German tradition here. In nice. Well, I, I think that's where we stole it from. And uh, you know, we, we don't have any culture over here. We just steal everybody else's. And, uh, and, and so we just want to thank you folks in Germany and Spain and Holland and Switzerland and all those places and, you know, for uh, giving us wonderful little pieces of your culture that, that, that we, can, we can claim as our own. <laughs> that being said, this is the Sir Gasson podcast. This is kind of Francisca's baby, and we've got a couple of really interesting people to talk to today. Francisca is going to introduce them for us. Yeah, happy to introduce them and very excited about our guest today. Today we have with us Sven Jensen, and who is the founder of Climate Cleanup, an entrepreneurial nonprofit organization from the Netherlands with the mission of restoring the global carbon balance by removing 1,500 gigatons of CO2 out of the atmosphere using natural climate solutions. One of the most promising and scalable solutions, according to them, is seaweed. And our second guest today is Elko Lehmann, who joined the climate cleanup to work on marine solutions and how the ocean can help sequester carbon. And together they are investigating if sargassum can help with carbon sequestration. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome, guys. I'm also really excited that you're with us today. And I think the Climate Cleanup is an amazing organization and you're doing lots of super interesting things. And since we're in the sargassum podcast, I just wanted to ask you guys, what is sargassum for you at a personal level? I could start at a personal level. I've got a historic background. 
my former career was as a seafarer, as a trained mariner, before I came, became an environmental scientist. One of the voyages I did was from New York via Bermuda, the Azores to the Mediterranean, on a 150-foot schooner with 30 dyslexic students on board, high school students. So we crossed from Bermuda to the Azores. We came through the area where there's a lot of Sagasso, Sagasso Sea. While I was on watch, all of a sudden, I saw this little island in front of us. And I thought, this can't be possible because we're in the middle of the Atlantic. And then, of course, that turned out to be a great heap of sargassum. And I'd never heard about it. So I looked it up and I found that this is floating sargassum weed. Later, I switched careers and I worked for environmental organizations for a while. And one of the organizations was, among others, looking into sustainable fisheries. And then I heard the whole story about the European eel that goes to the Sargasso Sea to breed. And then these little eels with the Gulf Stream flow back to Europe. I thought, this is crazy. But then after I joined Climate Cleanup, Sven and I organized a session and Sven invited Joost Wouters. And he told this story about the sargassum. So I'll hand the stick over to Sven. Atlantic sargassum belt, and this sounds enormous. Thanks, I've been thinking about your question, Francisca, for a little while, like what does it mean personally? And all this sounds super dramatic. It's for me, uh, sargassum represents the future. It started all with us, and let me set one thing straight. We're kind of co-founders. We, we started this adventure with a bunch of people. Uh, Joost Wouters was uh, one of them, and it started with meeting one man called uh, Tim Flannery. Have you ever heard, this, heard about him? He wrote a little book called Sunlight and Seaweed. But even before uh, Joost and, and me went to, to meet with Tim Flannery, because we were super depressed. Like, like I mean, how, how about you? Like five years ago, like climate change, everyone's trying to do something. Yeah, we have a Paris Agreement, but we know things are bad. And everyone knows things are bad and no one's doing a thing. And then when you ask a scientist, they would say, Mm, or a climate scientist, they would at the time or still say, yeah, well, actually, and they started whispering, like, yeah, actually, we're too late. Oh, and at the time we were like, uh, my partner was pregnant with our first son and we were like, what the, what the hell, what is this? What are we going to do? And, and seriously, got me, got me uh, depressed, like, until, and, and then I, I start reading up on things and I know what's going on. So I bumped into this work uh, of Tim Flannery, who is this kind of Al Gore meets Crocodile Dundee meets David Attenborough in, in Australia. But in the, in the Northern Hemisphere, no one knows about it. Uh, in Western Europe, people know The Weather Makers is a book that came out here. But then later on, he went to write like Atmosphere of Hope. And in that, he also describes seaweed and he thinks as a, as a scientist, he thinks like an entrepreneur. So he doesn't think like, we don't know what can be done so we're not going to think about it. If you, if you can't prove it, it doesn't exist. This is kind of scientific paradigm. But he thinks as an entrepreneur, like we don't know whether it's possible. So what would be the ultimate possibilities, you know, within the boundaries of science and, and, and not within the like limited boundaries of human Im imagination. And so he started painting this picture of, of all the possibilities that the ocean and that seaweed in particular could have in sequestering carbon, but also in bringing back life and bringing and creating livelihoods and creating all new industries and, and energy and, and all that. And he, he pulled it all together. And this was so inspiring. So Joost and I got a chance to, to visit a, a Tim in uh, Geneva at the time and said like, listen guys, yeah, yeah, I, think, I think still this can be done. You know? We've got those scalable natural climate solutions that have tremendous potential especially at sea, but listen up closely, the time frame to do it is really limited. It's a small, small window and it's shrinking. So we said, well, we'd better get going. Do you want to help? He said, yes, use my name and ideas like as you wish and run with it. So um, this is how it will start it. And, and since then we came together with a growing group of people with that mindset, like entrepreneurial people in NGOs or in governments, but also in, in like small uh, medium companies or innovative seaweed businesses and uh, 
this is so what extragasm represents is that this thinking in, in those possibilities of, of what can be done and what has to be done under the circumstances. You know, there's these old people, mostly men, who, who went through Second World War. So they said, like, this time when we were in the resistance, it actually was the best time of our lives. And this is kind of the feeling we're getting. Like, I mean, see, we've got serious stuff at stake here. And we've got adventures to take, uh, which we take very seriously. And then that's where the fun starts. So this is all <laughs> represented in sargassum at the moment. But it's not about sargassum, actually. Uh, we definitely feel you in everything you said, from the depression to the, okay, let's find solutions, and also the fighting through all these old, mostly male, unfortunately, heads that are sometimes standing in the way. It's not about sargassum. Ilko, I don't know if you feel that as well, but we, we thought, like, is this about sargassum, or is this a goal, or is it a means for us? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we've been discussing this relationship we have with sargassum. What is really nice is that we have a bunch of dried sargassum now. Ben has got it in front of him. And it's so nice to see it and to touch it and to really see that it's also an ecosystem. It's a sort of a magic, magic stuff that floats in the ocean and the sort of sheltering place for strange creatures that have adapted to the, to the same shape that look exactly like sargassum. You know, they're in there and that's their life. It's not just the eels that breed in a mystical way, but it's also all kinds of other creatures that, that are floating there. And, and it's just floating out in the ocean. Yeah, that makes it a really special type of organism. Okay, y'all are working on being a really, really great interview here. Just, just so you know. One thing that I really appreciate about with, with your, both of you guys' comments is that and this is something really lacking a lot of times in biology. You're speaking from your heart and from your mind. Mm. And thank you. I want to thank you for that. Uh, we, we, we need a lot more of that in biology mm. and all. And so, so thank you very much. Concerning the Atlantic eel, we got that same eel coming over here too. It ours comes up the rivers and then goes out there as well. And also that's something I'm familiar with. That being said, you guys and your team spent a couple of weeks in St. Martin, collect recent you know, study in sargassum and all and wonder if you could share with us a little bit about the situation there and some of the challenges that, that may be unique to St. Martin that we might not be seeing anywhere else. In our team we had some other people as well Fons Janssen, uh, Peter Lindemann and Bram Geers and for the rest we also cooperate with a couple of universities with uh, Portsmouth University, uh, Wageningen University uh, etc and all kinds of uh, entrepreneurs. In September uh, Fons and Peter went to St. Martin uh, got in touch with the St. Martin Nature Foundation. We were also in touch with people on Bonaire and other islands as well but we chose to go to St. Martin because there was a large influx of sargassum there and much more than on Bonaire. So what's interesting in St. Martin is that it's partly French and partly Dutch. It's on one island, but the, the way people deal with nature is quite different. What they noticed is that we knew about the sargassum washing up on the beaches and causing a problem for the tourists. But it's not just the tourists because they also found out that one of the other issues is that it produces fumes like H2S, which is toxic for local residents. And they started, they looked a lot into the impact on the local ecosystem. So what they did, they collected about a ton of sargassum just by hand from boats and also from the beach and did a lot of tests on the beach and dried all this sargassum and later shipped that to the Netherlands. So we have about 100 kilos of dried sargassum here. What they noticed is that they worked with local organizations but many people didn't really know about the issue. So they would ask people, you know, about this. And they said, yeah, yeah, we sometimes see it on the beach. But it's not. Yeah, there's a couple of people who are really interested in what it is, what it does, what the impact is. But it's not really common among the local people there. But the organization like the Nature Foundation and also people from the local government were really interested in the solutions we are trying to achieve. I kind of got a follow-up question that maybe then can address that, but the climate cleanup, it started as a, a maritime innovation impulse idea, and, I, and it really is a feasibility study on carbon capture from sargassum. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Sven? 
You mentioned in the beginning our goal, which is to remove 1500 gigatons, which is to double nature because plants and trees on earth actually turned out now contain already 1500 gigatons. So we just have to double it, right? Sounds feasible. Piece of, piece of cake. Piece of cake. Let's do it. And then uh, the sargasm, this interesting thing about it, it's so for us, it's not so much about sargasm per se, but about the fact that here's a growing ecosystem, which for us includes the people who are part of that ecosystem in many different ways. There's this growing ecosystem that's been actually the, the, the big bloom has been, you know, pushed by humanity. That's our doing that the stuff is there and those, those great amounts, you know, by fertilizer from from Congo River and Amazon River and maybe global warming, which also increases the growth and maybe extra carbon in the, uh, in the atmosphere and water. So there's this stuff, but it may be for us, it's mostly a teacher actually, because we're working uh, the mar maritime in innovation. Of course we need maritime innovation, but we need innovation on all fronts of what we actually call a new nature economy. What we need to do basically is move from an economy based on old plants to an economy based on fresh plants to not only to make energy, but also, or to just sequester carbon, but also to build our houses, make all the products we want, you know, grow our food. We could not use fertilizer made by a natural gas, but use natural fertilizers, for example, right? Ocean-based. So once you start connecting those dots around moving from old plants to an economy based on new plants, then the sargassum becomes a teacher. Because what happens is like, how are we doing a Tim Flannery at this grand idea of large scale kelp cultivation or you have it. How are we going to do that in such a way that it doesn't cause harm, that actually the local community is connected to the sea because there's many also profit from that and connected to it. And so how can we learn to develop this idea of large scale carbon sequestration or replacement of you know, old school, uh, old plant use? with fresh seaweeds, can we learn that through, through sargassum? So for us it, us, it actually came as a teacher. How do we create the conditions for those kind of new ecosystems to evolve and grow quickly as nature can, you know? Nice. Let me ask kind of a follow-up question on that, since you address it that way. And I mentioned my friend at the pre-talk, uh, Grazia Matamoros Arazo at uh, the Sea and Society Foundation at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. Apparently they eat a lot of seaweed up there. And I'm wondering if you guys or anybody else has looked in, into the nutritional value of the sargassum, either for people or for uh, livestock and such. I'm going to jump in. My, my first hunch would be like from the chemical point of view, there's an issue with the toxic metals. That didn't sound really like I want to eat this. Ilko, what do you think? Yeah, we haven't looked into that. But one thing that is, uh, Joost Wouters is, um, is researching now is if it could be used as like a sort of a fertilizer so that it would be in two stages it could then be used maybe for food but direct food for for humans or for animals we have not been looking into what what we did do is see how it could be turned into a material like paper or building materials etc and, and the most important thing we want to do in the next step is to see how we could store the carbon in the sargassum and what would be the best way to do that. M maybe in addition to what Sven said before, is that we'd like to look at it uh, from a holistic point of view. Holistic is a sort of a buzzword, but refer to the donut economy. So that means that you look at the solutions from different viewpoints. So it's not just storing carbon, but it's also looking into what it does for the ecosystem and what it means for the, for instance, local uh, island economy for social structures. It's a bit the same as with climate solutions on land. I mean, a fast way to store carbon on land is produce a monoculture uh, forest, you know, just all the same types of trees. But then you may only solve one problem, one issue in a short period of time to really work in an effective way you need healthy ecosystems. So if you want to plant trees, make sure you have a healthy tree ecosystem and also make the link with the local population, with local economies. That's the same for the sargassum. There's so many sides to it. I mean, the um, deterioration of ecosystem, coastal ecosystem is a serious thing. 
not just for the ecosystem, but also for the local population, for the island economy. Because if you destroy the coastal ecosystem like corals, seagrass, etc., that will also be detrimental for the tourist industry. Yeah, because people come there to see the interesting coral uh, subsea life. So it's all interconnected. And that's, I think, Kate Rayworth's uh, donut economy really fits well in here. Of ourselves as uh, the kind of accountants for the new economy. So then, in, you know, the donut economics just combines this idea of ecological boundaries with the social foundation. You know, what many people now do is, okay, we want to sequester carbon. Let's look at it, carbon and then sell carbon credits on that and then, you know, go. And we kind of think that maybe might work to start it off, but in the longer run, then you kind of create conditions for big monoculture systems that in the end aren't going to solve our problems or get us any further. So we are in a kind of coordinated attempt now to combine that carbon impact with the biodiversity impact and, for example, freshwater impact and the nitrogen phosphorus impact, plus the social situations. And then people think, whoa, that's way too much. No, it isn't. It isn't because it just provides a lens through which a certain type of solutions, Tim Flannery calls them multipotent. We love that word. We like to think of our uh, efforts and people as like multipotent people and multipotent solutions. But there's a kind of category, it seems, of solutions that kind of tick all the box. You know, and, and if we create also economic lenses to enter those solutions or, or to promote and grow those solutions, we think we might be onto something. So that's where we are. Nice, nice. I really appreciate where these answers are coming from. Elko mentioned local economies and how you work with local peoples and et cetera, et cetera. And then you both use the term biodiversity. Might I suggest that instead of saying biodiversity, biocultural diversity, because if you're supporting these lifeways of these local peoples, you're not just protecting biodiversity, you're protecting cultural diversity or biocultural diversity. I think that's a really important thing that you know we, we need to be doing together. So, so thank you. Thank you for that. Yes, um, me personally, I'm a huge fan of the donut economy as well. I think it's a really cool concept of figuring out what helps and what kind of boundaries we have to live within. And actually really exciting. I don't know if you all know, Curacao is now the first island who's going to use um, donut economy, which came out last week in the news or at least i learned about it last week and i got really excited about that so maybe saint martin is going to follow to get back to saint martin you started your work there and you may continue there do they already have solutions or are they using sargassum in any way or um, how are they managing it or how are they removing it what do they do with it after they remove it can you tell us a bit about that i wasn't part of the team that went to St. Martin. So the exact details are a bit difficult, but to my knowledge, there's not a lot happening. Gathering sargassum and putting it in the landfill, that's what's happening in a lot of the islands. But there is a difference between the French side and the Dutch side. Uh, I heard that uh, on some of the French islands, uh, the local gas company is also invited to help out. And so, uh, for instance, to produce produce biogas from food waste and sargassum but yeah the exact details i should ask some of the to one of my colleagues thank you what we're trying to do is like bridge those the kind of you might say western european thinking of we need an industry and big boats and we need to construct them and go there huh? go there like a new colonial movement or still colonial movement you might say go there and then impose our solutions because we're so smart huh? while the thinking that kind of emerged from the team was like all right there's these people that got fishing vessels they don't need them year round so how does that overlap with the sargassum season so can we devise of like collaboratively develop methods of uh, harvesting the sargassum at the right point like where is that and then process from there and maybe use biogas process if that's useful that's more along the industrial thinking but can we kind of merge those ways of thinking i think that's one of the main points that came out of there 
Nice, nice. Thank you. Then judging from that big old pile of dried sargassum in front of you, does it have a nice aroma? I would think that you took some back with you to the Netherlands. So what I like to know is what did you do with it? You just make building blocks or Legos out of it or make a salad or something? Or, or what are you doing with these, with this material there in the Netherlands? Chemical analysis going on within the scientific community. And then we are thinking about, for example, let's uh, have a prize. Like we have this stuff who come, who will come up with the best ideas. You know, and We like to work with student teams like the young bright minds who come up with a fresh vision. Currently, there's, uh, Joost Wouters is doing a couple of tests, among others, uh, to see if it could be worked as a fertilizer. But the uh, research institute uh, TNO in the Netherlands is currently doing tests on supercritical water gasification. If you know that, what that is, it's quite technical. You know, you bring it on a high pressure and then see if you can try to get the energy out of it. And then there's a University of Applied Science who is also going to use it to do all kinds of tests. And then indeed, that's what we want to do as a next step is have a sort of a call, even a sort of an award for people coming up with all kinds of ideas. And one of our colleagues, he works with bio-based building materials. I don't know how you call it. It's a type of a clay. Building blocks. Yeah, building blocks to make building blocks and maybe use sargassum as the... Aggregate. Uh, yeah. elements. Yeah. 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 Well, well when I was sitting in Sven there with this, you know, pressing down on it, I was wondering how much weight would that support before it started breaking up? How much pressure can you put on it before it starts crumbling? Or will it crumble? Crumbling. Yeah, you need to put it together, I think. Yeah, well, it looks it looks pretty strong right there, and it maybe you know, just mix it with some clay, like you were saying. It looks like it might be a really good aggregate to hold yeah. things together. Interesting, yeah, because yeah, like I said, we're trying to combine all the solutions. So this is a CLT block. Do you know CLT? Cross laminated timber. Uh -huh. There is actually a big fight in the construction industry between the old plant guy, girls and guys, and and the new plant uh, people. Because concrete is actually, of course, old animals, sea animals, mostly limestone. And so we are a quite fight actually to create an alternative for that. I think when we get like the parameters right about all the advantages that this stuff brings compared to the kind of incumbent uh, construction industry, then it becomes a no brainer really, right? But all this material that's actually is a problem now. That's how we, uh, how we look at those things. And then try to get our hands on it, you know, but you must have had other guests in the podcast who, who are working all kinds of innovative ways. So, yeah, we, we actually had the, the guys from the Dacazzo company in Mexico that are developing also a type of uh, concrete with sargassum. So similar mm -hmm. ideas. So, of course, as you said, it's like having all these different ideas put together and then we can start using the sargassum to substitute things that right now are not really moving forward like the old way of doing concrete, for example, because it produces so much CO2. And what I think it's also super interesting is that what people don't realize is that when you sequester CO2 with a sargassum, and then instead of maybe sinking it, you use it for something like this, you're also sequestering carbon, right? Like the carbon is still stored in there. So is this what you mean when you talk about this na double nature-based solutions? Or what is this concept that you talk about in your climate cleanup solution that is called double nature. Is it what you mean that you have this double use for your solution or what is it about? Good idea. If we can, uh, I would say you're hired. Um, if we could hire you anyway, um, uh, please join the team. We are, we, we operate as basically as a bunch of freelancers. So welcome. Yeah, the double nature. I mean, we are, we are very simple people. We just started with, okay, let's count the carbon that needs to be sequestered. Okay. Natural solutions have all those advantages. No, we need natural solutions. Okay, so, hey, the plants and trees contain already 1500. So, okay, double nature contains both this goal, this kind of physical mono, just look at carbon, a reductionist goal, you might say. Then double nature kind of puts them together. Like it changes your focus towards nature and also towards the scale of that we actually need to work on. But to put that extra layer on there, I like to always find that double whammy, that uh, multipotent edge on it. Yeah, definitely. You know, once you start connecting those things, it becomes so simple. 
in, in a way. And there's, there's our task probably in what needs to be done. Like, can we bring these big chunks of seaweed as teachers from the scale of, oh, this is a nice idea. Yeah. You can make some bricks of it. Like what happens if we actually build a city from this? Is that possible? What's needed then? You know, how do we organize that? That's got a vision and, you know, try to start from that vision. And then I think what humanity has been showing so far in terms of the impact we can make, let's turn it to, to a positive impact. One thing about uh, storing carbon in building materials. Recently, I had a very nice example. There was a friend of ours our bought uh, an old farmhouse and they wanted to uh, sort of rebuild it or restore it. So they took the ceiling out and they found these beams and then they called me and said, you got to come here and have a look. And I saw that the beams that was holding the whole building together, they were actually old masts or something, at least sparse from old sailing ships that may have put in there uh, like 150 years ago. And then I realized that these masts were from an old ship that the ship probably was had rotten away and then they reused the mast and the mast had probably been 50 years old. And then the tree that was used for the mast was maybe 200 years old. So there was this carbon sitting in that wood, in that that old building that had been there maybe 500 years or so. And I thought, that is great. That's really, really good. And now if you look at the regulation, for instance, in the Netherlands, is that if you make a building out of wood, according to the regulation, it will only sit there until that building is taken away. And then they say, well, this building will only last 50 years or so, because when it is taken down, it will probably be burned. So what we say, you really need to to change the regulation. You really need to change how you calculate the carbon that sits in such a building. Because now the calculation is really positive for concrete and it's really negative for wood. That's also the type of things we, you really need to, to approach. It's not just the practical stuff, but also, you know, the whole mindset and regulation of the regulators and that really need to change. Bio-based materials, you know, in 50 years, if you think about the climate impact at that time, that will be a capital punishment on that. Hmm. Seriously, think about it. Burn something like wood in 50 years time? With the water here, I mean, in the middle of Amsterdam, it will be flooded. Until recently, or still, you know, some energy companies can import wood chips from Canada to burn in the energy plants. That's insane. Yeah, well, they say that's negative carbon when they do that at all. Uh, But speaking about flooding, the U.S. has already had climate change refugees from flooding. An indigenous group down in Louisiana has been relocated because the island where they live is under salt water now mm. and all the the town charleston south carolina down on the coast there they experience flooding regularly from sea level rise and all stuff they've never done before and and it's a big issue and yet people see these things and say nah it's no big deal it's absolutely baffling to me robbie you said that you're not really aware of the geography of the netherlands but i can tell you that half of the netherlands is under the sea level so we're protected by dunes and dikes, etc. Dutch companies are really good in, in building that sort of infrastructure. But of course, this is not lasting. Actually, I'm not as ignorant as I make out to be. And I'll, um, <laughs> I, I at least learned about your windmills and wooden shoes and tulips and stuff. Yeah. And so no, no, I understand that. And it's a big issue for them. But your issue with that is just countries built in a low place. And y'all been dealing with that for ever, I guess. And it's certainly going to impact you, you folks a whole lot more. What's the name of that island that's, that's been flooding? Do you know that? The island is Isla de Jean Charles in Louisiana. Yeah, so I guess if we want to stop this type of things from happening, we really have to get at it right now. And you guys have this very ambitious goal of 1,500 gigatons, which is a lot. I think people cannot even imagine how much that is. I guess that number is coming from restoring the carbon concentrations in the atmosphere as they were before the Industrial Revolution. That's why the number is so high. And now my question is, we know now that we have a lot of sargassum in this um, Atlantic belt, but is that sargassum enough? Like how many gigatons of sargassum do we have there? Because I think it's around 10. 
So how do you think sargassum can actually contribute to your goal of 1,500 gigatons of carbon fixation? A lot, by any means. So it's, this is why we call it really a teacher. So it teaches us actually right now as how to work with nature in the oceans towards carbon sequestration. That's what it does. Yeah, it might be a little piece of the puzzle. I mean, we need a thousand solutions, maybe a million different places, and they will all add up like a tree. I'm looking at a tree and the leaves are just coming out. And this single tree is, I don't know, how many, how many thousand leaves? Maybe even a hundred thousand or something. And, and together they power the tree. And this is just one tree. You know, this, this is, we think we should look at that from that perspective as, as nature, uh, nature works on it. So it's not this one solution and it's not this one place, but it's, it is about looking very seriously at this at it, uh, as a teacher. And maybe one addition, it's, I mean, at first we were looking at the amount of sargassum that is there and uh, the amount of carbon that is in the floating sargassum, or at least the sargassum that washes up on the coastline, could we somehow store that carbon is, which is in there? But there's another element that is maybe more important even, that is the uh, carbon that is stored in the coastline, in coral, in seagrass, and mangroves, etc. If you can save those ecosystems, you will again store a lot of carbon and maybe that's even a greater quantity. So the two combined, so restoring and protecting ecosystems, storing the carbon that is in sargassum and helping island economy together, that can create uh, huge benefits. Yeah, uh, there you go again, the, the double nature effect. That's, yeah. yeah, yeah. You're on the meta level, yeah. There yeah, you go, yeah. And also some way island economies can create something useful like building building blocks out of sargassum. That also means that you don't have to import more concrete or so. So it's a complex puzzle, but I'm sure that if you add everything up, then it will be a considerable amount, not reaching the 1500 gigatons, of course, because we also have to do a lot with, you know, agriculture and forestry and uh, all kinds of stuff. But in the end, it will be an important part of the equation. Nice, nice. I, I like what Sven said about, you know, or I like what you said about, you know, looking at the big, big picture with these other ecosystems as well, because they're all important. Everything's connected. But Sven said, you know, we might need this here in a million different places. And all the Creole people of Belize, they say one okra, one okra full of basket and all. And one thing at a time and you'll have enough is what essentially mean. And I think that's the kind of message that a, a lot of these indigenous people and my friends and colleagues can understand very well. And also thank you for that. This is a lot of really interesting stuff you're sharing us and, and we really appreciate it. But how are you communicating your findings to local communities in St. Mark, you know, fishermen and, and other stakeholders and whatnot? One thing is we had uh, articles in the local press when my colleagues were there. That's of course one thing, but also we will share the report that will come out in about two weeks time. And we will share that with all the people that were involved, not just the scientists and the companies we've been working with, but also, of course, the local island economy and etc. Yes, I think that's really important because there's so many scientists or groups that come to an island, do some work, and then they just take it away and the islanders never hear of what, what came out of it. And that's really yeah. sad. But I'm, I'm happy to yeah. hear that, that you guys are going to inform them about what you found. A really interesting thing about your nonprofit is that it's actually funded by its members. So how does that actually work and what are the benefits of it? I'm a member myself and I pay 30 euros a month. And it's just, uh, you know, there's this automatic bank uh, subscription. So you just, uh, it's like, a, you know, you can go to the gym or... Uh, fund climate solutions. So we are with over 200 members now. There's a place for 1,500. We really thought, well, this is nice because in, in many ways, if we uh, collaborate like this, because not only we get the money to work from, but it's also uh, independent money because if everyone, you know, kind of owns uh, this, then no one owns it. It's just the goal is the only thing that will lead us. So that's in, independent. But it also, it creates relationships with all those people, all those like-minded members who all start thinking along. 
So this is, yeah, we're, we're just trying here. We, we're just one year old when we started with a big event and then Corona. So it was a very small online event. And we're still happy to be at 200 members now. We celebrate our first year in the anniversary now on May 26th. Uh, it'll be an online event, so you're welcome. Uh, that's easy. <laughs> that's a good thing that happened to, from COVID, right? We got very savvy on that. But we, what we really see is there's people we just meet on a weekly basis on our double nature talks and it's one hour talk, one hour working session and just all kind of kind of initiative starts to emerge and, and you know, you know we just a group of people uh, who share the same goal and we start helping each other. The, the central question is always like, what do you need? I can ask you for the, pod, for the podcast, what do you need? What would you need? Our chair person, uh, Ruth, he's an entrepreneur, he introduced LED lighting into the Netherlands a couple of years ago like 20 or 15 years ago, when everyone thought that a LED LED lamp would kill you, right? Seriously, and would make you blind and all, all the nonsense. It's something that we learned from him. Like he always says, like when talking with innovative entrepreneurs, like, what do you need? And it's a simple but very strong question, I think. And all these people that uh, bring up their ideas and work with the climate cleanup, are they all working on a volunteer base or? Like you don't pay anyone, right, to do the job, or you do, or how does it work? We do. We we kind of self fund now the people who actually do the work on a kind of full time basis, like Ilko and me. And we kind of self fund our salaries for like two thirds at this point. But so we we have something to live from. I think the main thing when you want to really make meaningful climate impact is to steer your professional life towards it, right? So really engage your life to working on climate solutions. It's the big thing you can do. So this is, this is the, the privilege we have actually right now. This, there's a bunch of paying members and finance funders like the MIIP and funded this Sargassum Phase 1 project and WWF who uh, did some innovation funding and, and other partners from provinces. And we are starting to build a, build a team because of course we should make this professional life why should a banker earn you know a million and why should we definitely subsistence or, or be loved but we're creating a new economy will come out very good i think so too i think the start might be a little bit more difficult or slower but in the end i mean this will be the businesses that will be the major part of the economy and i mean big industries like the oil industry they will have to reinvent themselves and then what better than changing to things like seaweed cultivation and usage? So I'm sure this will... Bright minds in the oil industry, they can work with us. Excellent. This last comment you made kind of feels like you're investigating new life ways for the planet. And we really appreciate that. We need to start wrapping up now. I want to thank Sven and Elko for being with us today and our listeners. All of you could have been anywhere on the planet today, but you chose to be here with us. and We really appreciate you. Zvan Elko, we, we hope to talk to you again sometime, and you're always welcome here. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Thank you for your time, and go for it. This is a great, great meeting. I enjoyed that. These, these guys are doing some really important stuff. Yes, I think it was super cool to hear from them. I really like the idea they had that when they talked about, you know, the people who were in World War II and how these people say that that was the best time of their life because they had a purpose and they were working on something really big. And that's actually how I feel about this period we are in right now. Like, yes, it's a huge responsibility we have. We literally have maybe nine years left to fix this climate problem before it becomes something that's out of our control. And we just have to see the world burn in front of our eyes slowly or fast, whatever will happen. But at the same time, next to having that responsibility, it's also very exciting to have this responsibility because we can be people who make a huge difference for future generations and even for our own lives. And I think that's really exciting and I'm excited to work on this stuff. I know a lot of people nowadays are still indifferent to this big task or don't realize that we have it. And that's why I, I keep telling people about it because I want everybody to know that we have this task so they can step up and, and be part of this solution. And yeah, we need everybody on board to do this. Definitely. And I think like, first of all, people like you 
you know, telling everyone about it to make people move, this is super valuable. But at the same time, what these guys are doing is they give you the opportunity to say, hey, we're this nonprofit organization, no matter what your background is, if you have ideas on how we can tackle this issue, we want to fix 1,500 gigatons of carbon. Come to us, help us, we will do it together. And I think that's also beautiful, right? Like this, let's get all the aligned minds together and just work towards this goal. And as he said, Sven said, this is just about the goal. It doesn't matter, like the rest doesn't matter. This is just about what we want to achieve and how we're gonna get there. And I think that's great. And I think more companies or nonprofit organizations have to be created that have this same background and this same train of thought so that we all just need to jump there. And then it doesn't matter what your job actually is. You can basically jump onto this train and contribute to the solution. Yes, like there is well a, an NGO that does solutions. And at the same time, there's this membership club that connects everybody and makes sure that people talk to each other and have, have a networking platform. I think that's really powerful. I think that's all we have for the day. Remember folks, we are the Sargassum Podcast and now you are too. And we'll see you again next week. Have a good week, everyone. Have a good week. Hey, thanks for tuning in today and learning with us from our guest. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, then, then check with our uh, show notes and links and information in our archives below. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please consider supporting us financially by becoming a Patreon. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and take part in an exclusive monthly Zoom meet and greet for Patreons where you can network with our podcast guests and other sargassum enthusiasts. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support from the Kimberly Green Latin American and Caribbean Centers, U.S. Department of Education, Title VI grant. It is produced by Marcel van de Kamp and Francisca Elmer, and your hosts today were Robbie Tickpen, Francisca Elmer, and Mar Fernandez. We will be back next week with another exciting guest. The music of this podcast is from the song Dem A Pray by Drizzle Road Rana, an artist from Ruatan. Follow him on Spotify or YouTube for more music. But for now, here is the full song Dem A Pray. Hey, brother, hear me now. Brother, dog. Know me. Understand. Now for them no one pissy we get nothing That's why they my free and always front and star Now for them no one pissy we get nothing That's why they my free Now for them my free Free they my free They my free me no gain progress Now for them my free They my free me no gain success Now for them my free Free they my free They my free me no gain progress Now for them my free they my pre me to reap success So me tell them ya yeah. Rapid is my man, me no take that Only if it come from ya I'll accept that Not for them I put my trust in and give me set back Yo, but select that Me lamp pull up that Tell some wicked that Bad mind, me no fear them Anytime them cheat and chat Me no hear them Me dash a few hearts so for the queer them Me dash a few hearts so tell them wear them Not for them I free they my free, me no gain progress, not for them I'm free They my free, me no grip success, so me tell them yeah Yes, me know me have a lot of fake friends But me never would have taught me would have have fake family So me tell them straight, me no trust them Me no trust you and me no trust him Fake friends lost, lost bad mind in a real life Star, me no rate that, star, me no rate that When the real family would have bust a million shot in a real life real, real, real Now for them a free Them a free, me no gain progress Now for them a free they my free, me no great success Now for them a free They my free, me no gain progress Now for them a free They my free, me no great success So me tell you yeah. Look 
a like But them a hate and grudge and creep on mine Them a move like Judas Them a move like Judas Plus everybody have a life to live So they give one rash clock to a try judge me Like them chit chat to what them want to say Cause none of them out there not pee Them a them a Them a free me no in progress Not for them a free Them a free me no rip success Not for them a free Them a free me no in progress Not for them a free Them a free me no rip success